Hi, this is Jeff from the Ozark Mountains. That's in Missouri, in the USA. Well, today we've got another pocket computer to refurbish. This is the Radio Shack PC-1, also known as the Sharp PC-1211. It comes with the printer and cassette interface dock. And, yep, we need to put an LCD in this. These all have bad LCDs. And we need to refurbish the printer, probably put some new NICAD batteries in it or replace them with nickel metal hydride and get this all cleaned up and working again. Let's get started. Thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. They do circuit boards of all sizes, small circuit boards, medium circuit boards. They can even assemble them for you. Are you a maker who likes sharing your ideas with other makers? If so, you can submit your articles to the monthly submission for PCBWay and earn coupons and notary titles. Check out the link in the description below. So here we have our pocket computer docked to the printer and cassette interface. And I've got the power cord plugged in here, which will power the unit and charge the batteries. And if I turn the power on on the printer, you can see that it does feed the paper and that type of thing so that part is working and I let it charge up for several hours and if we unplug the power cord now and turn the power on the low battery light is blinking at us it won't feed paper now so that gives me some hope that everything inside is not shot since we still have some movement and the low battery light is blinking and here we have our computer and it just slides off like this. Here is the bottom of the cassette interface. So here we have the computer and as you can see the LCD is pretty well shot. If I turn it on you might just be able to see some outlines of something there and if I type some numbers you can just kind of see those. Some of these are almost all black so you can't see anything. And unfortunately this doesn't like to run the beep command from immediate mode. When you first turn it on, after you hit the reset button, it'll be in run mode. And if you press mode once, you can go into program mode where you can type in 10 space beep space, say two or 10, just some number. Press enter and you'll enter that program line. Press mode again, you'll be in reserve mode. Mode again, you'll be in define mode. Mode again, you're in run mode and we should be able to type in run now that's awfully difficult to do though if the display is completely shot because you're blindly pressing mode hoping you're in the right thing and you don't know if you're not but at least there's a shot of making it do something you know make it make a beep so you can see if it's alive before you try to put the uh, lcd in there so putting the LCD in this is a lot like that PC3 we did in a previous video. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started on this guy now. This little guy comes apart pretty easy. There are four screws. The two away from the battery compartment are shorter and they are the same size. Maybe five millimeters long and the two at the battery compartment are closer to say 15 millimeters long and they are the same size. Where the slot is is where the battery compartment is. Then you just lift up by the screw holes and slide this way. You can see you have this funny battery hold down thing. There's an image here of how the batteries go in. And it's telling you to press all reset after putting new batteries in. These are um, hearing aid batteries, 675s. So they're not too expensive, but you either buy a few of them for a ridiculous price or 60 of them cheap. So. <laughs> it's 
It's rather funny how the pricing structure works. Set those to the side. This is our beeper right here. This is the all reset. This is one of the two processors. This actually has two four bit processors. I think if we pull that screw out, let's see, I set him right there by where I took it out so I can keep track of what's what to start with. Yeah, those are the same. And this will kind of tilt a little bit. You can kind of see down in there. Like so. So on this board, when you get that open, you'll see several chips. The chips on the keyboard side are the display drivers, the LCD drivers. And there are six little screws in here. These are machine screws, so they're different than these two. But so far, they all look like the same thing. I'm going to take my little point and shoot camera here and take a picture of where these wires that are tacked onto the board where they connect. Because at times when you're messing with this stuff, you can bump one of these wires and it'll break off and then you're like, Oh my gosh, where did that wire go? And there's one more little screw hanging out there. Okay, that's another one of the machine screws. It's got a little bodge board here. out of the way there's something hiding something here okay here's another screw and that's an identical machine screw and here's another machine screw yeah, this is some sort of bodged in chip. I don't know what that is. So we got a lot of extra junk in here. It is an MSM 4013RS. Okay. 4013 gate. Got a long plastic screw there. No, that's a long machine screw. That's for the speaker on that side. That was just kind of sitting over a post on the other side. The speaker's going up under here somewhere. I've got a wire attached to this chip down here. Oh my. And we need to get the battery wires out of here. There's this one. So that is just kind of on top of this plate, which is the one we need to get out of there. Yep, I just shook some keys out of place. Ah, fun, fun, fun. All right, so I'm just going to drop these keys in here and hold it up and check the other side to make sure they're right. Okay, I got all the keys put back in the right spot, I believe. And we've got our circuit board sandwich here with our little bodgy board on here. And there is a really short flex cable right here. 
which we will very carefully need to pry up like this. And there's another cable right here too. So I want to be careful of that. Get you in where you can see that. These are some weird chips right here. The 4019s. But there's something. They're spaced up by something underneath it. So I wonder if that was done to act as a spacer against this board. Because there's like a little pad on top of this thing. There's spacers under these chips, which are the RAMs. They're TC5514Ps. Those are 4-bit uh, static RAMs. Yep, and there's a spacer under this chip too, which brings it up level with this. So those are all to act as a standoff to this top board. That's an interesting way to do that. So we've got some tacked on components. But what we are interested in is there's four tabs here for our LCD and four on the bottom and one on each end. And if we take a look at this side, we want to notice that the dot is on the left hand side. There's also a little cutout window here, which is as important for our uses. That may have been used by the factory to register this in a fixture or something. So we'll take our little screwdriver here. I'm always like making sure it's nice and smooth. There's no burrs or anything to tear up the board. I'm just going to try to start all of these tabs up. Like so. Times like this, I wish I was ambidextrous like my dad was. When he was born, it was still frowned upon to be left-handed, so he had to learn to do everything at school right-handed. But he made the best of it, and he wound up being ambidextrous and could do everything equally with both hands. I'm just using these small little pliers. Kind of straighten up those tabs. They're just big enough to do the job and not so big as to destroy stuff. And right here, see if I can zoom you in on that. You can see we've got these diodes tacked on here that go to our negative battery terminal. That's probably some sort of reverse polarity protection. So I just want to be really careful right there not to bump that. Okay, now we've got all our tabs bent up. Carefully kind of rock this back over. And then I'm going to take this little spudger tool. Just going to slide it along there very carefully. Give it a twist. And this circuit board is very thin. And it looks like it's phenolic, so it's going to be rather weak. So don't get in a big hurry. The zebra strips here have been stuck down so long. They kind of act like adhesive. So that's all it took to get our LCD off. That wasn't too difficult, was it? Okay, before trying to get the LCD glass out of the frame, I'm going to grab a hold of the zebra strip very carefully. Let's try to pull it away from the edge. 
be kind of a little bit gentle with these so you don't stretch them or mess them up. Very carefully peel that off of there. I'm moving my fingers down as I go so I don't stretch it out. Nice and slow. There we go. Yeah, sometimes the tweezers work really good for that. And sometimes they're just the wrong tool. It's amazing how useful these little plastic spudgers come in. Okay, now we got the zebra strips off there and we'll get the tool to separate the LCD glass from the metal frame. Before we take the LCD out of the frame, notice I'm holding it as it would be in the uh, computer now. We've got our dot on the left hand side. And if I rotate that over, the LCD glass is pushed up against the left hand side and there's a little gap here. And you might just be able to see there's a little bump or a little nipple there on the glass. So we want to push the glass that way when we re reinstall the new one. And uh, this way it's pretty much centered. That's not as critical because all the electrodes run in this orientation. Now, to separate the two, rather than soaking this in, at, in acetone for hours, I'm going to place it on this hot plate, which is about at 100 degrees C. And we'll just let this set here for, oh, about three minutes. And then we can pop that right apart. Okay, after a very riveting three minutes of watching an LCD frame heat up, we've got it here. Got a couple rags here so I don't burn myself. I'm just kind of pushing against the glass just slightly. Ow. It's hot, but it's not really budging. Yeah, there it goes. I'm going to try with the spudger and slip it in the edge there. I think I'm just going to let this guy heat another couple minutes. It's being a little cranky. It's been on there a long time. Okay, it's been a few more minutes. Let me grab this guy again. I have to do this off screen. I don't have any pressed press. Maybe I can do this. Yeah, that'll work. Okay. So I'm just using the, the edge of that spudger under there to encourage that glue to break. There we go. Goodness gracious. Most of these aren't this difficult. This one really liked where it was and it did not want to move. Okay, goodness gracious. All right, normally I like leaving the adhesive in place, but half of this pulled out with the LCD. So I will get some acetone and just clean that out of there and then we'll move on. Wow, cleaning that glue out of this frame was a pain in the butt. I bet I spent 15 minutes on that. But I've got it sitting here, it's all nice and clean. I wiped up the little glue goobers from the work surface and washed my hands. I've got a brand spanking new LCD here. I've got the nipple on this end and the dot on that end, so it really needs to go this way, the nipple toward this end. And this has a clear protective sheet on it. 
which we need to just peel off of there like that. And it also has the polarizer built onto the glass. So we've got the nipple at this end, so I'm going to rotate it over. I am going to slide all the way down toward the end with the dot. Just drop that into the frame like that. If you can manage to keep the little adhesive strips in there, then the LCD will be stuck down and you don't have to worry about it sliding in the frame. Since I had to clean that out of there, I'm going to double over this plastic sheet that we just pulled out, double it over again. Yeah, I made it crooked. Again, and again, about four times that should do it. This is something that Robert Baroche demonstrated in his video. So we'll just slip that down in there like so. That keeps it from wanting to shift. And we're centered vertically, so all is right with the world. I've got a Q-tip here and a little alcohol. So we'll clean our new LCD contacts. There, I just centered that up just a tiny bit. I'm going to get the zebra strips here on a clean sheet of paper and we'll do the same. Just trying to get my keep my fingers off the conductive side. These have a slightly tacky surface and they can pick up junk from the disassembly process. So make sure you clean them up really good. Well, this one's got a little bit of funny trimming on this end. It kind of goes at an angle. So I'm going to put that at the open end. I'm touching on this non-conductive side here. So keep that little foot away from where it would make any difference. Yeah, I knocked it over. Zebra strips wobble, but they don't fall down. Okay, strip number two. This one looks like it was trimmed okay. It's a bit like trying to push a wet noodle. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm going to take my little spudger tool and just slide the zebra strip down next to the edge of the LCD. And just kind of squares it up. Give it a bit of a pat. Now, before we install it on the circuit board, I'm going to clean all these gold contacts here. And we'll go ahead and do all the, the keys while we're at it. These look nice and clean, but we've got it apart, so we might as well do it. There we go. Yeah, there's not much junk came off of there. Go over this one more time. Looks good. All right, the LCD dot is at this end, which is the left end of the circuit board. So I'm actually going to do this kind of a backwards way and install the circuit board onto the LCD frame so we don't disturb the LCD in the frame. And we just have to push him down like that. 
take our little pliers and on this I found it's easier to take the pliers and just rotate not if you try to push you can slip if you just rotate then your, your motion is down so you're not likely to to fly away and scratch a trace or something LCD in the frame installed. I'm going to bring this part back over and note this yellow bit right here. That is the polarizer for the old LCD, which we do not need anymore. There's a bit of adhesive right here. So I'm going to try to slip my spudger under here. And just just try to dislodge that it's stuck down to kind of a bit of a metal frame we don't need this polarizer anymore but it would be fun to save it to play with for other things there we go okay yeah I don't know Got a bit of a bend in it. This thing naturally has a little bit of a bow. There we go. Okay. I think it just keeps pressure on everything. Got the glue cleaned off of this guy. And it has a bow in it like that. Naturally, perhaps not that much, but it'll flatten out when we put it together. I've got a little brilliant eyes on a cloth. Just going to go over the inside of this plastic to make sure it's clean. Don't want to get it put back together and then have crumbs in there or fingerprints or whatever. got it apart. I'm going to go ahead and clean all the rubber contacts for the keys. Probably not necessary, but it's apart, so this is the time to do it. New LCD. Make sure there's no crumbs or fingerprints on it. Try to slip it back together here. So, this bottom board slips under a ledge there. Okay, I went ahead and put in these six screws and these two screws, which are the machine screws that are all the same. I'm just going to tighten those up. That'll keep the buttons from wanting to bounce out of place. Get this stuff out of the way. And try to get our little bodge board wires. Okay. That is the longer machine screw that's unique. Now we've got the speaker in place. Kind of poke all these wires down here. That went in there like that. Getting these battery wires repositioned. Okay, so we got 
him in there. Got this one kind of poked back around where it was, down in that little crevice. That guy like that. That guy like that. Okay. So that looks reasonable now. And polish up the outside. Well, this little uh, flexible one in the middle slid it this way. Have to figure out how to correct that. That's a pain in the butt. Okay, before I try that, we will uh, try to put some batteries in here and see if we need to mess with this contrast. It's on, I need to adjust the contrast. It's a little strong. And, you know, I can slightly tell the difference when I'm pressing mode and it's going through everything, but we're gonna have to mess with the contrast and I need to slide this metal piece that way a little bit. So I'll take this back apart, I'll slide that over and then we'll play with that contrast setting. Okay, it wasn't too difficult to get uh, this piece centered in here. I just had to take these eight screws, nine screws loose, and I just tipped the boards up a little bit, and I was able to get in there with a little pokey deal and just slide it a little bit and then put it back together. Uh, one tip that Robert Baroche gives on his video for this pot, um, since it can't be moved, they put so much lock stuff on there you just can't move that pot it's just to bend up a little tab in here for it which is what I did and that makes the perfect adjustment for the LCD strangely enough what's that one for I have one extra PCB screw here all of these are there that one's there that one's there Uh, there's one down in here. Okay, I'm going to have to pull the batteries back out. Yep. There's one other of those little screws in this area right there. Okay, I don't have to pull the screw out. Yay! Okay, so crisis averted. Now we just have these two little plastic screws to pop in here. It's kind of sad they decided to put so much goop on that contrast pot to make it useless. But, you know, they weren't expecting people to be tinkering with these 40 years later. There we go. Got our little bodge board kind of stuck in there. If we turn this over, turn it on, you can see how good that display looks. Just that is a beautiful looking LCD. I like it. Everything seems to work, so we'll get this put the rest of the way back together and we'll try it out. All right, so I had to take it back apart. Uh, the one extra short screw that I put up there that was in the wrong spot, it actually goes here. All right. Now we can put all this jazz back in. That's why this little plastic looked unfamiliar when I took it apart. Because they put that over there to cover all the bodges. Now we can slip that on there. Long screw. Long screw. There we go. All cleaned up and nicely working. That is beautiful. All right, let's try the, that printer and see what we can do with it. Well, here is the printer slash cassette interface. 
Okay. It looks like we've got three screws here. It's kind of a curious deal. It's almost like making sure that it's set down on the table before it'll run. It's kind of an odd thing. It's funny, I found the service manual both from Radio Shack and Sharp for this, and both show a battery compartment with an external door. But both talk about there being rechargeable batteries, and obviously there's no external battery door. So. Okay, all three of these screws are the same. There's little plastic screws. Is that the only three screws? Or there may be some hiding under the rubber feet on the front. Nothing there. Oh, great. I'm going to have to glue that on. What about here? No. I'm going to have to glue that one on, too. There we go. Okay. And it slips forward, it looks like, like that. Okay. Looky there, Radio Shack Rechargeable. Okay, there's a plug there. I think this was for a pass-through for the bus. It looks like there's some, the connector and maybe some other things aren't populated. That little button thing on the bottom, springy deal. Just goes up to the bottom of the printer. Kind of rotates it up a little bit. A little battery juice there. Okay, so... We've got four NICADs, double A size, that are wired in series. We go directly from the charger to the pack and directly from the pack to this circuit board where the switch is. Now it looked like that chip was cracked. It was just a mark of something on it. Okay, there's a little schmaltz on the board right here. So I think I will take some pictures before I take anything apart and then I'm going to snip these wires just away from the terminals because this corrosion will have come up in here and then we'll need to do a little cleanup on the circuit board and on the case and we'll need to build a new pack so I'll have to see if I've got batteries for it Okay, a little snippety doo dah there, 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 and there. All right, it looks like we can unplug that. This is a Polarized connector so we don't have to worry about getting it plugged in backwards. And to get our wires loose there from this half. And then we got this half. I think we'll start with this half. And just with a little alcohol and a q tip. We'll get in here and get this battery schmaltz cleaned off. Interesting, there's a little trap door here. It goes to right there. 
the only thing I see on there on the circuit board, I'll point it out when we get to the main circuit board there. There's a little pot. Let's see if there's anything in the manual about that. Looks like we've got one, two, maybe two screws, and the printer it just kind of sets in there. Yeah, no screws there. Okay, those are the same size. And yeah, that just tilts up. We can pull the printer out like that too. And there's kind of our foam pads on a ramp here that the printer sits on. There's a little spring attached to that foot and that presses up against the back of the printer. That not anything exactly. This printer says M152 uh, Roman numeral 2 uh, Shinzu Seiki. So that's who made the printer. And yeah, this guy, I think I'm going to take to the sink. Get him cleaned out, get all that battery juice off of there. And this isn't too bad. There's actually a lot of flux on this end of the board, which may have helped it. There's a little corrosion here, which we'll need to clean off. And a little on these connectors, but that's not too bad at all. Can't tell. We'll have to strip some off of these wires. Sometimes it'll actually travel down the wire. But, okay. So I think I'll go wash this in the sink, which you guys know how sinks work. So uh, then we'll come back and we'll kind of scrape this board up a little bit, tin up those areas, clean up the connectors, that type of thing. Okay, let's get this board cleaned up. First thing I'm going to do is take a little flat blade screwdriver and just get the worst off the top of this board. Brush away the crumbs with the Q-tip. also some corrosion around these jacks right here which is a little harder to deal with but I cooked up some citric acid this morning so, you know figure there's a guy in the Ozark cooking with chemicals in his kitchen what could it be making well I'm just diluting some citric acid from its anhydrous form now, this is about 40 percent this stuff is you can buy it in a granular form very inexpensively uh, you know, dissolve it in some water and you've got some nice citric acid for cleaning up battery spills. So I put some in a syringe here and we'll squirt some in all the jacks. And onto the circuit board. Now, why did we use citric acid? Well, because the NICAD batteries that are in here the electrolyte in there is actually a base, so or an alkaline. Uh, that's another word for it. So we need to use an acid to uh, neutralize it. And citric acid works well. It's fairly innocuous. It's easy to get. It's inexpensive. It's safe. You know, all that kind of stuff. So use the least obnoxious chemical you can to do the job. And uh, we'll just let this set on here for, I don't know, half an hour or something. I've got other stuff to do, and then we'll uh, 
flush this off with some water, give it a scrub with like the fiberglass pin, flush it off with some more water, and then uh, rinse it with some 99% uh, alcohol and let it dry thoroughly. So our circuit board cleaned up pretty nicely here. We just had this one area here on the top which I cleaned and then sealed and the citric acid and water and alcohol trick cleaned up all this nicely. I replaced these shorter wires which run over to the battery and there was a few spots here on the bottom which kind of confused me as to where they were and then I realized it was where the board set in here so that's where things were able to collect. But that was all there really was on the bottom of the board and you can see all our connectors cleaned up nicely even the power connector. So we need to go ahead and reassemble this thing now. I also had to replace you know, six inches or so off of each of these cables that run from the top cover down to the board uh, because the corrosion leaches from the battery through the wire. You can't just cut the end off and try to fix the end. You've got to cut back till you get to good wire. Okay, let's go ahead and reassemble this thing now. Got that little button and spring in here. Board sets in front first. And the printer goes tail end first, like that. There's just two little screws here holding the board in place. Backwards till it seats, and then forwards or anti-clockwise and clockwise if you prefer. There we go. Oh, all you can see is my hand. Should have been a hand bottle. Okay, there we go. I've got this part back together. I should take the cover screws out of there. That was a good place to store them. I built a battery pack. It's 4.8 volt nickel metal hydride, 2000 milliamp hours. It was probably three to four times the capacity of the original pack. Uh, with the way this charging system works, it's just time based. Uh, you can substitute a nickel metal hydride without a problem. Fits in there just like that. I did a video on how to build these packs with tabbed cells. I'll put a link to that below. I also did another video with kind of an extreme circuit board repair. I'll link to that in the description below too. So if you're interested in more of those techniques, uh, just look down there for those videos and you can see how I did that. Now we're going to have to pop this thing out of here somehow and I think that wire is just about the right length as it is and from this one we probably want to trim it to about right there There and there, maybe a little more off of this red one. Okay. And then we're going to have to get the top over here too. Okay, I've got both halves of our case sitting here. And I routed the wires kind of like they were before. That ought to work. Something like that anyhow. And... Our positive should be about right, and cut that negative off about right there. So we'll have our positive, positive, or negative, negative. And we'll strip a little wire off each one of these. been a lot easier if they used a connector, but connectors are actually relatively expensive. Okay. Slip that 
sheet shrink over there like so and make sure the power switch is off there while we're connecting things so we're not turning stuff on and off all right Price of the proper spot welders for building battery packs keeps coming down to the point that might be an attractive option if you built a lot of them. Got a nice wide tip on this iron, it's about 3 16 switches. Um, four-ish millimeters, I guess. Between four and five millimeters. Yeah, okay. That's on there, but my hands were awfully wiggly. Couldn't hold the battery in the wire at the same time. Okay, that's better. Just spit on my fingers, try to cool that down. And hopefully that heat shrink is the perfect size to slide right over there. Oh, it could have been a size larger to tell you the truth. Okay. Well, that's how we're going to solder those wires on. I'm not happy with how this heat shrink is fitting, so I'm going to take this one off, put some larger heat shrink on, and then solder the rest of these wires on, and then we'll pick back up. Okay, we got our battery pack fitted. Added some a little longer heat shrink. It's about an inch long for each piece, and got the wires routed around. Will there be out of the way of the mounting post there? Got the connector connected. So we should be able to rotate this guy over like this. And I finally got that closed. I had to play with the routing of the battery wires in the wires in this area. They need to kind of go into here, not toward the board. But after a little fiddling and holding the mouth at the right angle. Just give this a bit of a wipe down. Get all my grubby fingerprints off of it. We go. On, our low battery is not on because the batteries were charged up already. And kind of looks like if you just slip the paper. That's kind of tricky to do is to get the paper to go right in the right direction. How about that? I had actually ordered some ribbons and they are taking an age to arrive. So I added some WD-40 to this, sprayed a little bit of WD-40 on a Q-tip, wiped the ribbon, you know, mainly rotated the ribbon through just to see if we could get enough ink to print a few things. If I can manage to install the ribbon. So. Now. We're almost set. I 
about that. That looks sort of official, doesn't it? All right. Now we are all plugged in. It should be ready to go. Let's give it a test. Well, I got out my only cassette deck, which was in working order, but it is in pretty sad shape and it's not working well. I was able to save from the PC-1 to the cassette, which you can hear. Uh, the level is okay for recording on a cassette. It's too low for the computer, so that didn't work out well either. I've got a, a couple other cassette decks, the really small ones, which were made for pocket computers. Only I have those apart waiting for belts. So um, I can show you the printer on this though, even though the ribbon's pretty weak. We turn the printer on with it in print mode and we press on twice in a row. And we're in programming mode here. So if I type LIS, it'll send the output to the printer instead of to the screen. And it's actually the print's getting a little more legible as it goes. So it's good enough that we can tell that the printer is working okay. Um, but it definitely needs a new ribbon. The computer is working fine. The cassette part is working fine. Um, we can manually trigger the remote relay. Listen real close. I don't know if you can hear that here. I'll hold my microphone closer. You might have just been able to hear that little relay inside clicking. So we've got everything working. That's pretty exciting. We've got a uh, PC-1 with a brand new LCD that looks great. We've got the printer cassette interface working with a brand new 2000 milliamp hour nickel metal hydride pack. Um, so all the owner of this needs to do is add a cassette recorder or get one of those uh, cassette recorder emulators uh, to use with this. That would work as well. It's a pretty nifty little unit. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this video. It was a lot of fun putting a new LCD in their little PC-1 here. It's good to see this thing is working just as good as it did 30 or 40 years ago. Our cassette and printer interface also came out good. It's sporting a new battery pack and it's all cleaned up. We got that corrosion out of there. I uh, wish my cassette deck here would have cooperated so we could have saved and load, but we can kind of tell those features are working, so it should be good for the owner to go ahead and play with. If you have any questions or comments, well, just leave them in that comment section down there below. I would love to hear from you. Thanks to everyone who helps support the Hey Burt channel through Patreon and other means. It's greatly appreciated. Well, until next time, bye.